Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video, we are going to be looking at a few problems from the topic of Young's double slit experiment and you could say interference of waves. So starting with problem one, we have a Young's double slit apparatus that is immersed in a liquid of refractive index mu1. So this area over here is filled with the liquid. The slit plane touches the liquid surface. A parallel beam of monochromatic light of wavelength lambda is incident, is incident normally on the slits. And in the first option, we have to find the fringe width. Okay, so we have to ignore these slabs here because these would be introduced in the later options. So fringe width is a term that we discuss when we study YDSE and, and it is basically the distance between two adjacent maximas or minimas. Formula for fringe width is lambda, which is a wavelength of the light passing through the apparatus times the separation between the screen and the slit plane divided by the distance between the slits. Okay, so in this problem, okay, so when light passes through a medium of refractive index mu, what will happen is first of all, its speed changes, it becomes C by mu, and also its wavelength will change. It will also become lambda divided by mu. As d and small d are kept constant, the fringe width is simply lambda capital D divided by mu one, which is the refractive index of the liquid, times d. So this would be the fringe width in this particular case. Okay, so now let's move on to option b. If one of the slits is covered by a transparent slab of refractive index mu2 and thickness t as shown, find the new position of the central maxima. So now this slit s2 over here, it is covered with a thin slab and the slab is kept behind the slit plane. Okay guys, so before the transparent slab was introduced, the central maxima was over here, right, at the point o. And the path difference between these two rays coming from slit one and slit two, where zero at this point. But now because of the introduction of the slab, there will be some optical path difference introduced as a result of which uh, the path difference at point O won't be zero anymore. So the central maxima would have shifted a distance above or below, which we'll discuss about right now. And that's what we have to find. So firstly, we have to consider two uh, light rays. Uh, let's call this point as one and an analogous point that is approaching slit S1 as point 2. So light rays from point 1 and point 2, this is approximately how the ray diagram looks like. Okay, so first let's determine the optical path length of light. Okay guys, so let's consider a slab of refractive index mu1 and thickness t. So, that, uh, so firstly, when light passes through a medium of refractive index mu1, what will happen is its velocity is gonna decrease, right? It's velocity, say divided by mu1 in this case. So let's say the time it takes for light to cross the slab is T. So now let's say there was there were no medium present and it was just simply vacuum. So in the same time, light would have covered a higher distance, right? A greater distance, right? Because the speed is C in vacuum. So this length over here is called the optical path length of light. Uh, so let's try to derive the formula for that. Okay, so let's consider the surrounding medium to have a refractive index of mu2. Let's determine the time it takes for light to cross a slab. So it will simply be equal to the distance divided by the speed of light, which is D divided by C divided by mu1. Okay, this is the time taken by light to cross the slab. Now in the given time, let's say light covers a distance of D dash in our medium, in our surrounding medium, whose refractive index is actually equal to mu2, which means uh, in this medium, the velocity of light, let's call it V dash equals C divided by mu2. So now as we have the velocity and the time, the distance d dash can be obtained by multiplying the two. So it'll be c divided by mu2, which is the speed multiplied by the time, which is mu1 d divided by c. So the optical path length of light in this medium is equal to mu1 divided by mu2 times d. Okay, and uh, usually when we talk about optical path lengths, we discuss it when the surrounding medium is vacuum. So we set mu2 equals to one in that case. And in that case, the optical path length becomes mu times d, which is a formula that you guys might be familiar with. Okay, so now we are gonna use this result in the above equation. Okay guys, so in the in our given problem, we had to determine the new position of the central maxima. Okay, so which basically means that we have to find the point where the optical path difference between the two light rays is zero. Uh, consider one ray that is passing through slit S2 and another ray that is passing through slit S1. So the ray P over here has to pass through the slab, which means some optical path length is introduced over here. Will the path difference be zero at a point above O or below O? And the answer is it will be above the point O. And the reason for that is the extra optical path introduced by the slab can be compensated by the extra physical distance that a ray from slit S1 has to travel. Let's call that point 
as P. Let's call the starting points as point A and point B. All right. So now the so what we have to find is the optical path difference BP minus AP. Now, okay, now the geometrical path difference we can easily determine because we know that D is much greater than D. So if we assume this angle over here to be theta, we know the geometrical path difference is going to be this distance over here, which is simply equal to D sine theta. Okay, so now what is the optical path length of light as it goes through the slab? So it is equal to mu2, uh, that is the refractive index of the slab times its thickness, right? Now, if the surrounding medium had some refractive index mu, let's say, then we have to di divide it by mu. Okay, so this is the optical path length, but we have to subtract the, the original length, which is the thickness T of the slab from it. And the reason that we are doing this is because uh, consider the whole length AP. So what we are doing is subtracting T from it and instead of it, including the optical path length mu T. And that's the reason why we are subtracting T. This is again going to be d sine theta mu2 minus 1 times t. Okay guys, now we are going to use the small angle approximation. So uh, now this angle theta over here is very small. So we can consider sine theta as approximately equal to tan theta, which is equal to y by d. Okay guys, now solving for del p to be equal to 0, we'll get the value of y as this particular value, which is the shift in the central maximus. Okay, so now in option c, uh, what they're asking is the ins... In front of the slit S1, we have placed a slab of refractive index mu3. And as a result of that, the central maxima actually comes back to the point O. Then we have to find the refractive index of this new slab that is introduced. Okay, guys, so now we have to consider both S1 and S2. Okay, so the, the ray coming from slit S2 will reach point O like this. The ray coming from slit S1 will reach the point O like this. Let's call this point A. Let's call this point B. Okay, so now the optical path difference at point O equals is going to be AO minus BO. Okay, guys, so here, okay, so in this particular case, the geometrical path length is actually the same, right? Because uh, due to symmetry, we can see that both the lengths are same. And del O is equal to zero, which so basically the optical path length of light from A to O is equal to the optical path length from B to O. Okay, so the extra optical path length uh, introduced due to slab S2, T, which is the thickness of the slab, times mu2 minus 1, as we discussed in the last page. And this would equal to the optical path length introduced by slab S1, which is equal to the T, which is the thickness of the slab, times the refractive index of the slab is mu3. But here, the thing is, we have to divide it by mu1, because the surrounding medium is now uh, the liquid of mu refractive index mu1. So this thing minus 1. And after solving this, you'll get the refractive index of the third slab to be mu1 multiplied by mu2. So that is the answer to option C. Now in the option D, we have to find the ratio of intensities at center of the screen in all the three conditions. So guys, in case one and case three, the delta at center of the screen was equal to zero, right? In which basically means Intensities uh, at, in these two cases are the same and in constructive interference we know the intensity at the point equals 4i0 given that uh, the intensity of light coming in through both the slits are the same. Okay. In case 1 and case 3 the intensity is simply going to be 4i0. But in case 2 to first calculate the optical path difference at point O. Okay. So this is let's say how the ray diagram looks like. So what is the optical path difference in these two cases? So in this case, uh, the geometrical path length is the same, but uh, due to the introduction of the slab, we have an extra optical path length included, and which is equal to mu2 times t minus one. So this is the optical path difference at the point O. Okay, so now the formula, this is the formula for finding the intensity, which is directly, which is dependent on the phase difference of the interfering light waves. Now, as we know the path difference between the light waves, we can calculate the phase difference between them using the formula that the phase difference is 2 pi by lambda times the path difference. Okay, so now applying it to the formula. So this is the answer for the ratio of intensities in each of the three cases. So that was question one. Now let's move on to question two. Okay, guys, so in this question, we have a prism angle A, uh, which is very small, which means this is a thin prism over here. And it is placed in front of a point source S, um, at a small distance of D. A screen is placed at a large distance of capital D, uh, as shown in the figure. Find the fringe width of interference pattern given that source is emitting light of wavelength lambda and refractive index of prism is mu. So they're claiming that interference is happening. Uh, there is an interference pattern that is observed on the screen. So we have to find the fringe width of the interference pattern. 
Okay, so before we solve this problem, we need to be knowing a result that if we have a thin prism and let's say the angle of prism is A and if a light ray passes through the thin prism, okay, then the result uh, is that after the light ray passes through the prism, it gets deflected. The angle of deflection delta is given by the formula of A times mu minus one, where mu is the refractive index of the prism. So, and this is again only applicable if the prism is thin. Okay guys, so now uh, let's consider a uh, ray. Okay, so now and let's say it gets deflected by an angle of delta. So now let's say if I, uh, now let's say I extrapolated this line. So uh, for a person standing over here, it would appear as if this refracted ray was coming from an image source of S dash that was present over here. So now let's say the distance S S dash is X. Delta is going to be very small by the fact that even A is very small, right? Okay guys, so basically this is how the real case is going to be looking like, right? I just, uh, so the reason I drew this way is because to enhance the, enhance the diagram. So this distance over here, I can write it as D multiplied by the angle delta. So now basically what we have is if we remove the prism, we have a source S and a fake source S dash, uh, which are emitting light. Both the sources are coherent as it is coming from the same light. And this situation, as you guys can see, is analogous to our YDSC experiment now. In the, so in our YDSC experiment, the fringe the fringe width beta was equal to lambda capital D by small d. Okay, so in this case, in this particular case, uh, D, which is a separation between the slits, is equal to D delta. All right, so this is going to be lambda capital D divided by uh, D multiplied by delta. Again, uh, it is equal to A multiplied by mu minus one. So this is the answer for the fringe width in this particular case. Okay guys, moving on to uh, our third and final question. We have two uh, parallel beams of light P and Q. They are separated by a distance of D and they are mutually coherent. They are incident normally on a prism. If the intensities of the upper and the lower beams immediately after transmission from the phase AC are 4i and i. So basically after refraction, the emerging rays have a intensity of 4i and i. So we have to find the resultant intensities at the focus of the lens which brings them into focus. No, so okay. So what they're trying to say is uh, these rays after refraction, uh, they'll get refracted by some angle and we have introduced them to a converging lens which converges them to a focus point and we have to find the resultant intensity at this particular point. Okay, guys. so whenever we have to find uh, the resultant intensity, the first thing that we have to find is the path difference at that particular point between the two different waves, right? Okay, so first let's just draw a clean ray diagram. Okay guys, so this is how our ray diagram looks like. So let's call the angle of prism as theta, which basically means uh, even this angle is going to be theta. And let's call the angle of refraction as uh, R, let's say. So firstly, we can apply Snell's law at point one. So mu sine theta equals sine R. Okay guys, so uh, now what we're doing is like we're placing a, placing a converging lens over here, which would focus these rays onto the focus of the lens, okay? So we have to find the optical path difference between these two rays. Okay, so this point is one and let's call this point as two. So till point one, if I drop a perpendicular onto the ray two, okay, so, and let's drop a perpendicular from point two onto the other light ray. Okay, guys. so till uh, this point one and after this point two, the light rays have no optical path difference. So the optical path difference, let's call these points as three and four as well, okay? The optical path difference, optical path length 1, 4 minus the optical path length 3, 2. Okay, guys, so now we have to find the geometrical length 1, 4. Okay, so for that, let's call this distance as x. As this angle is r, this would be 90 minus r and this would be r. So this angle is r, which means basically means the length 1, 4 is going to be x sin r. And as the medium is, medium surrounding is air, we can write it as the optical length 1, 4 is going to be x sin r minus okay so the optical length 3 2 so this angle will be theta which means the length 3 2 is going to be x sine theta as the ray is now present inside the medium inside the prism we have to multiply it with mu so it will be mu times x sine theta now the beautiful thing about this problem is that mu sine theta is actually sine r right so if you substitute this over here you can actually see these two terms cancelling out each other and the optical part difference at the point let's call this point as p it will turn out to be zero, which means the two waves are gonna constructively interfere at the point P. Okay, so if you have two waves uh, whose intensities are I1 and I2 respectively, and at the point that we're interested in calculating the intensity, if the two waves have a phase difference of phi, then we can calculate the intensity of the resultant wave using this 
formula, which you might be aware of. As they are constructively interfering at point P, cos phi would simply be one, which means, okay, and I1 is given to be four I, I2 is I. Uh, so after calculation, the answer comes out to be nine I. So that was it for this video, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want such concept specific videos, do comment down below, uh, also including the concept that you want a video of. And yeah, that's about it. Thanks for watching.